During the chaotic months between South Carolina's secession from the Union and the first shot at Fort Sumter, congressmen were scrambling to find a solution that would head off a civil war. One of the most intriguing proposals that went nowhere came from Democratic Ohio Congressman Clement Laird Vallandigham, who later became one of the so-called copperheads who criticized Abraham Lincoln's war effort. Unlike most negotiators who looked for one way or another to humor the South on slavery-related issues, Vallandigham sought to alter the balance of power through three constitutional amendments summarized by historian Frank L. Clement in his book, The Limits of Dissent, Clement L. Vallandigham and the Civil War. His suggested 13th Amendment listed four geographical sections, North, South, West, and Pacific. A majority of the electors in each of the four sections would be necessary to the choice of the president and vice president. The amendment also changed the president's term to six years with re-election possible only if the incumbent received a two-thirds majority of the electoral vote in each of the four sections. Furthermore, controversial measures introduced in Congress needed the approval of the majority of senators in each of the four sections. Vallandigham's proposed 14th Amendment sanctioned the principle of secession. No state could secede, however, unless every other state within its geographical section gave its approval. His final amendment, Article 15, guaranteed equal rights in the territories to all citizens, southern slaveholders, as well as northern freedmen. Vallandigham's proposal was lampooned and misrepresented in the press by Republicans and even misunderstood by many fellow Democrats. But after the war began, he continued to argue against coercing the South, and reports of his speeches often found their way into Southern newspapers. Today I'd like to share portions of diary entries by Edmund Ruffin of Virginia, who was such an avid disunionist that he attended John Brown's execution in 1859, and I suggest you check out my video about that. Although these entries were written during the war, not what you technically call the antebellum period, they offer a fascinating glimpse into how at least one Southerner viewed Vallandigham's dissent and what was happening to civil liberties during the conflict. April 3rd, 1863. A long and able paper by W.B. Reed of Philadelphia and also an able speech of Vallandigham delivered in New York to the Democratic Association have lately been published. Both advocate the immediate secession of the war unconditionally and the making of peace with recognition of the CS. Vallandigham treats with due severity and scorn the Democrats who, while professing to desire peace, advocate the vigorous prosecution of the war and reconstruction of the former Union as a condition of peace. It is true that he also looks forward to reconstruction as likely to be the wish of the independent CS after time shall have smoothed the asperities and abated the animosities produced by the war and its outrages. If Mr. V and the Northern Peace Party can lay this flattering unction to their souls, be it so, and we need not trouble ourselves or say a word to dispel their illusion. On the contrary, I wish it may extend as far as possible and have the greatest effect on Northern minds. Their error will bind us to nothing for the future. And if, without compromising our independence or any political principles or rights by surrender, I'm willing to make peace almost without conditions and leave it to the future and our then established strength and abundant means for war to assert and maintain any rights ignored and passed over at first. May 11th. General Burnside has had Mr. Vallandigham arrested for expressions in a public speech by a military company and the breaking down the doors of his house. He has been tried by a court-martial whose authority he refused to acknowledge and would not defend himself before, and the sentence had been agreed upon but not then made known. The arrest was made in Dayton, Ohio, Mr. V's residence, and in the congressional district which he lately represented. His illegal arrest and imprisonment caused a riot by some of the people on his side and the burning of some houses and destruction of property to a considerable amount. But the outbreak was quelled by the military, acting under Burnside's orders, and some 15 of the rioters 
were arrested for trial. These results seem to indicate the impotence for resistance of the people opposed to Lincoln and the full supremacy of the military power. May 20th. Though the sentence of Vallandigham by court-martial has not been officially announced, it is reported in Washington that it was to two years confinement and hard labor with other condemned criminals on the fortifications of Dry Tortuga, but that Lincoln had commuted the punishment for exile to the seceded states. If true, I trust that this will not be permitted by our authorities. If permitted, it would be a capital stroke of policy for Lincoln to identify Vallandigham with secessionists and their cause, and so render him suspected by his countrymen and destroy his popularity and influence. It would more certainly defeat his election as governor of Ohio, for which he is a candidate, than his being confined and treated as a felon at Tortugas. May 22nd. A very large public meeting called by formal notice of the Democratic Party has been held in the city of New York in which speeches were made and opinions uttered of the most violent character in denunciation of the administration and its violations of the Constitution. All the utterers of these sentiments are as guilty and as amenable to punishment as felons as Vallandigham. It is reported that many thousands of men in the northwestern states have leagued together and bound themselves by secret oaths not to submit to the conscription law and to resist its being enforced even by arms and bloodshed. But I have ceased to attach much importance to any such indications. If the malcontents truly designed to resist illegal and unconstitutional oppression and tyranny, they have had enough of better grounds than the conscription law. The arrest and sentence of Vallandigham alone would have been enough to drive to armed resistance and insurrection every true defender of his political rights. I think that the federal administration has measured the extent and value of the threatened resistance and correctly estimates it at nothing. In New York, with a malcontent governor and an equally divided legislature, and in New Jersey, with both governor and legislature malcontent, the case may be different. And if those who think so think for and direct Lincoln, no illegal or unconstitutional punishments will be attempted to be enforced against citizens of those states. May 27th. Vallandigham's destination to Fort Warren had been changed by Lincoln's commuting his punishment to exile to the Confederate states. He was brought under flag of truce and turned loose near Shelbyville, Tennessee, where he was received. I hope that neither he nor our authorities will consent to the continuation of this arrangement. He ought not to remain, nor our authorities to permit his remaining. If he does remain, it will be giving effect to a capital stroke of policy by Lincoln or by those who lead him. There has been another popular meeting in New York by which still more violent resolutions were adopted than by the previous meeting and by which peace is called for unconditionally. This is a step far ahead of any before taken by any Northern malcontents. That's where news of Vallandigham leaves off in Edmund Ruffin's diary. Um, I've got a bonus entry for you here from a Rebel War Clerk's Diary by J.B. Jones. Uh, This is from June 22nd. Today I saw the memorandum of Mr. Old of the conversation held with Mr. Vallandigham for file in the archives. He says if we can only hold out this year that the Peace Party of the North would sweep the Lincoln dynasty out of political existence. He seems to have thought that our cause was sinking and feared we would submit, which would of course be ruinous to his party. But he advises strongly against any invasion of Pennsylvania, for that would unite all parties at the North and so strengthen Lincoln's hands that he would be able to crush all opposition and trample upon the constitutional rights of the people. Mr. V said nothing to indicate that either he or the party had any other idea than that the Union would be reconstructed under democratic rule. The president endorsed with his own pen on this document that, in regard to invasion of the North, experience proved the contrary of what Mr. V asserted. But Mr. V is for restoring the Union, amicably, of course, and if it cannot be so done, then possibly he is in favor of recognizing our independence. 
He says any reconstruction which is not voluntary on our part would soon be followed by another separation and a worse war than the present one. Well, we now know that Mr. V's prediction that the South's attempted invasion of Pennsylvania would end up uniting the North and badly weakening the peace movement came true after the disastrous Battle of Gettysburg. As for Vallandigham, both he and Jefferson Davis shared Edmund Ruffin's perception that exiling Mr. V to the Confederacy was Lincoln's way of trying to discredit him as being not merely pro-peace, but anti-North. Vallandigham was allowed to ride on a Confederate blockade runner to Bermuda and then sail to Canada, where he spent the remainder of his exile and got the bad news that he lost his race for governor of Ohio. What do you think are the proper limits of dissent during wartime? And do you think it's just as well that Vallandigham's four-section scheme never came to pass? Or was it a valid way to prevent one part of the country from dominating other parts? Let me know in the comments. And click the link in the description below for more of the mysterious Mr. V's story, including the bizarre circumstances of his death, at my website, antibellumetc.com. And help this channel go viral, or at least develop a mild cough, by subscribing, smashing that like button, and sharing with anyone you think might be interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.